there's not been a lot written or covered about uh, Grant's early life. His father was born in western Pennsylvania, as was his mother. His father's name was Jesse Grant, and his family came to the Western Reserve area of northern Ohio. And at the age of 15, he landed a uh, apprenticeship in the tannery of a gentleman by the name of Owen Brown. Owen Brown was the father of the famous radical abolitionist John Brown. His mother also was born in western Pennsylvania. The two of them met when Jesse Grant was offered the job uh, as a foreman for a tannery that was established already in Point Pleasant by a gentleman by the name of Thomas Page. And it was Thomas Page who introduced Jesse Grant to Hannah Simpson. They dated for a very short while, were married, and moved into the little cottage there in Point Pleasant. And about a year after, after the wedding was born their first son, who they christened Hiram Ulysses Grant, on April 27, 1822. Jesse Grant wanted to start his own business, so he was an entrepreneur. So he'd saved his money working for other tanners. Claremont and Brown County uh, split around 1823 uh, or thereabouts. So at that time, Georgetown was established as the new county seat for the new county of Brown. And uh, Jesse Grant saw that as an opportunity to establish his own business in the new county seat of Brown County. So that's what uh, led them to move to Georgetown. The na a neighbor boy by the name of Bailey lived across the street uh, from uh, the Grants there uh, in Georgetown. And uh, Jesse Grant hears uh, that uh, the Bailey boy had flunked the entrance exam. And so Jesse Grant has this inside information, first information, that there's now an opening at West Point. Uh, then, as now, the local congressman has responsibility of nominating uh, and putting forth uh, candidates to, for, for the military academies. Jesse Grant had, eight years prior, had a falling out with the local congressman, uh, Thomas Hamer. So he was not on speaking terms with the congressman. However, he was on speaking terms with the U.S. Senator at the time, who also happened to be from the same area. His name was Thomas Morris who was from Bethel. Thomas Morris worked as the intermediary between uh, Jesse Grant and Thomas Hamer, and Hamer very graciously uh, uh, said, yes, we will put in your son's name, Ulysses S. Grant. Hamer uh, assumed his first name was Ulysses, because that's what everybody called him, assumed his middle name was Simpson, because that was the mother's maiden name, of course. Bantam, Bethel were in his congressional district. Uh, so he signed the papers, Ulysses S. Grant. And so when Grant shows up at West Point, he calls out for the fact that that's not my name. And the Army basically said, it is now unless you want to get reappointed. <laughs> After he graduated from West Point, he was stationed at Jefferson Barracks, Missouri. And that uh, was near the homestead of his roommate, Frederick Dent. And his roommate introduced him to his two sisters. Uh, Ulysses was originally fond of the youngest sister, but eventually uh, started a relationship with Julia Dent. Julia's father uh, did not uh, approve of the relationship, did not want her daughter to be married to a military man because it's a vagabond life. Being, you could, don't know where you're going to be stationed, as it is today. And so um, uh, while they were trying to convince Julia's father that uh, uh, to approve, the Mexican War breaks out. Grant, who was assigned to quartermaster duty, which is the supply chain for the Army, uh, oftentimes he would find himself at the front and getting engaged in things that he probably weren't, wasn't supposed to. And uh, Grant uh, is cited for bravery on at least two occasions. Julia's father was convinced after the war that this guy's all right. And uh, so he approved and they were married. Grant was an incredibly devoted family man. Uh, he missed Julia uh, desperately. He had a second child born who he had never met, never seen. And uh, so he resigned his commission uh, from the Army to be reunited with his family. Grant was not immediately recognized. Uh, in fact, he had come to Cincinnati, where General George McClellan was recruiting officers uh, for the war. And Grant came uh, from Galena to Cincinnati to uh, apply 
Uh, he's a West Pointer. Uh, he's trained. Uh, and he comes to the Burnett House where, uh, where McClellan's holding court. And he sits in the lobby uh, waiting to, uh, to get an interview with McClellan. McClellan never calls him. He does that two days in a row. And he goes back to Galena without having even given a hearing. The governor of Illinois, Governor Yates, he appoints Grant to organize uh, the Illinois militia uh, volunteers. And he, and he gets a bunch of frontier uh, ruffians together and, and whips them into a, a disciplined fighting machine. And he's recognized for uh, the, the discipline of, of the volunteers and eventually catches the eye and then through the help of some local congressmen eventually did get his uh, appointment uh, into the federal army but uh, at I believe at the rank of major and then he proceeds to very aggressively uh, uh, take territory initially in Kentucky uh, Paducah he, he takes Paducah without firing a shot he was so uh, I guess eloquent in, in, in his communications that uh, that first got uh, the uh, uh, Lincoln administration uh, attention in terms of, hey, this guy knows what he's doing. Then he proceeds to win uh, battle after battle. While in, back in the East, there's a stalemate. Uh, McClellan never has enough men and materials uh, to uh, aggressively go after General Lee uh, in Virginia. And Lincoln is frustrated with that. So if we have Grant in the Western theater, uh, success after success. Lincoln uh, uh, eventually sees that, that Grant is his man. He is the one who, who should be promoted. Uh, so Lincoln says that, uh, learns, uh, determines that Grant is his man and, sh and should be promoted to the highest rank and the, and the guy who's going to uh, see the war through. And Lincoln was oft quoted as, as saying that, that he never consulted many times with what Grant was doing because he knew Grant was going to, to, to do the right thing. Grant had uh, no, uh, uh, again, uh, political experience in terms of government positions. Uh, he was a military man. Uh, and, uh, so, and he had no ambition uh, to be the president. Uh, Grant became embroiled in some of the uh, controversy in the Andrew Johnson uh, administration after Lincoln was assassinated. And uh, Grant saw that uh, in the Johnson administration uh, that, uh, that reconciliation with the South was not going to happen if it was left to the politicians. So he reluctantly accepted uh, the Republican nomination. He was intimately familiar with what Lincoln's uh, notions were of how to uh, reconstruct or reconcile the South. And so he had a, a strong sense of purpose in terms of what the war was about and what the aftermath of the war should be and what it meant in terms of a reunified uh, country. His life after the presidency, uh, again, he was extremely popular and uh, so uh, unfortunately, his family got him into another business deal, uh, and uh, that didn't work out well for him. And so he, uh, the family settled in New York, New York City specifically, and uh, were involved with a Wall Street firm called, uh, that was named Grant and Ward. Uh, Ward, unfortunately, was the Bernie Madoff of his day, and uh, was selling worthless uh, stocks and other, other uh, articles, and uh, it finally uh, collapsed and Grant was left pretty much holding the bag and, he, and his reputation and his honesty and integrity were so high that he uh, did everything he could to make sure that the investors were, uh, were repaid. So he sold all of his assets, all the, his collections of military memorabilia. Shortly thereafter, uh, he found that he is uh, suffering from throat cancer and is on his deathbed. And while he is uh, uh, trying to recuperate, and, and he knew it was a death sentence, uh, he's approached by Mark Twain, and they uh, collaborate initially, and Twain gives him a very uh, 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 good terms uh, to publish his memoirs. So his last act uh, was writing uh, his memoirs, 
which he finished basically uh, at least two weeks before he, he finally passed away in 1885. Uh, and uh, Twain, uh, two weeks before he, he passed, came to Grant's bed, uh, bedside and said, uh, General, we have advanced sales of over $300,000 for your memoirs. So he died knowing that his family is going to be taken care of. Uh, and uh, those, those advanced sales eventually uh, uh, amounted to $450,000, which was an incredible sum of money in, in the late 19th century. So to give you an indication of how popular Grant was, uh, uh, upon his death in July of 1885, his funeral took place in New York City. There were over one and a half million people that lined the streets of Broadway to see the funeral procession. That funeral procession was over seven miles long, and they had to turn people away that wanted to participate. Both Union and Confederate generals, former generals of the Civil War, were his pallbearers. Several years later, 12 years later, uh, uh, William McKinley, President William McKinley, another Ohio president, uh, was at the dedication of his tomb there on Manhattan Island, uh, there on uh, uh, the, the Hudson River. Um, another one million people attended the dedication of that tomb. This is 12 years after he had passed away. Uh, and his tomb there in New York is, is, is the largest memorial mausoleum in North America. Frederick Douglass, uh, who was uh, the, the quintessential uh, African-American leader during the Civil War and a confidant of Lincoln, uh, was a huge supporter of Grant. In fact, Frederick Douglass held Grant in higher esteem than Lincoln, and he credited Grant with freeing over four million slaves and, and, and fighting for their rights. So Frederick Douglass himself said Lincoln uh, signed the Emancipation Proclamation, but Grant made Emancipation fact.